Hey everyone, it is four o'clock in New York. I'm Alicia Menendez, in for Nicole Wallace. Breaking news this hour, we are covering yet another mass shooting in this country. This one on the campus of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas yeah, this afternoon. This. It is still early, but minutes ago, police said the suspect now dead. As for victims, police say there appear to be multiple, although how many exactly is still unknown. At least one of the scenes of the shooting, UNLV's Beam Hall, home to that university's business school, near yards from the student union. Law enforcement is still asking people to avoid the area. Joining us now, NBC News Justice and Intel correspondent Ken Delanian, former FBI counterintelligence agent Peter Strzok, and with me at the table, professor of politics and journalism at Morgan State University and host of A Word with Jason Johnson podcast, Jason Johnson. Ken Delanian, we start with you. Please fill in the gaps wherever possible. What do we know? Well, Alicia, about an hour ago, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas Twitter account uh, posted an alert that said that university police were responding to a confirmed active shooter in BEH, which stands for Beam Hall. This is not a test. Run, hide, fight. Uh, and what we know from reports is that uh, that, that caused a cascade uh, of students, some evacuating, some trying to lock down in their buildings. Uh, a lot of concern. UNLV continued to tweet updates. Eventually, um, they, they tweeted uh, a, a report of an addi additional shots fired near the student union, which is not far from the first location. And then they, uh, the Las Vegas uh, Metropolitan Police Department reported that the shooter was contained, and then a short time later that the shooter had been deceased. Uh, neither organization has released any information about casualties, whether there have been fatalities, what type of weapon was used. Uh, it, all, all we can intuit from uh, their, their uh, tweets that we're talking about one shooter here, now deceased. We don't know uh, male or female. Uh, so a so lot of questions about this. Uh, but uh, it's very clear from the response by authorities that this is a very serious situation and there do appear to be a number of casualties. So, Ken, you, you have police saying the shooter is dead, but they still want people to stay away from the area. Do we know why? It, it, no, and it's, the short answer is no, but it may be because they want to preserve their crime scene, retrieve shell casings, gather evidence and things like that. They don't want a stampede of students uh, trampling across the crime scene where they need to gather evidence, uh, retrieve weapons, that kind of thing. But there is, there is a bit of a, a situation that, uh, unfortunately, we've seen this all too many times where um, people do the wrong thing in these situations. It's it, what the run, hide, fight mantra uh, does not mean simply, you know, lock yourself in a room and stay there. In, in some cases, that can be the wrong decision to make. And, you know, I've actually done stories where I've attended active shooter training, and the experts will tell you that is not necessarily the thing to do. And yet it seems to be the thing we're seeing over and over again, particularly in these university and school settings, um, where actually what what the FBI would tell you the first thing to do is to get out of there, evacuate. And in fact, that's what uh, UNLV urged people to do in their in their Twitter, uh, in their initial tweets about this. Um, but, uh, you know, what we're seeing is that students are apparently hunkering down in classrooms and buildings right now. Peter Schreck, pull back the curtain for us. Give us a sense of what it is that law enforcement is doing at this moment. Well, I think Ken laid out very well what's going on with local law enforcement and the assistance, I'm sure, of state and federal authorities. You, you've got to, it's, things are still very much in flux, although it appears that the gunman is dead. Law enforcement wants to make sure that there are not any accomplices, any co-conspirators, any explosive devices or any other hazards that even though deceased, that the gunman might have been left behind. And so there will be a very deliberate, cautious process designed to ensure the safety of everybody involved to not only make sure that the threat is over, but as Ken indicated, if there are people who are sheltering in place in classrooms, that the situation is resolved in a way that doesn't result in any further injuries. So this is going to take some time. Information is going to evolve over time. And certainly, you know, the tragedy is that just blocks away, you know, six years ago, uh, the Mandalay Bay shooting, where scores mm -hmm. of people were killed. And, you know, that unfortunately, the, the expertise from that mass shooting, you've got a number of people who were very competent in going into situations like this and ensuring that everybody uh, is safe. Talk to me, Peter. Police, they'll now be trying to identify this shooter. How will they go about that? 
Uh, well, so there are a number of things. I mean, first is, uh, of course, to identify who the person is, uh, if they have identification on them or what if they don't, uh, how they might figure out who the person is. They'll be looking at their electronic devices, their cell phones, to see who they were communicating with, where they live. There will almost certainly be search warrants drafted up for the person's residence. And the goal, of course, is to find out, was the person acting alone? Were they in contact with other people? Who were they communicating with? Whether they have other weapons, whether there might be other things which would pose a risk to the community still out uh, and not in, in the control of law enforcement. And of course, at the same time, law enforcement is going to be building a criminal case, collecting evidence, you know, whether this person is deceased. So, of course, they're not going to be tried of anything. But if there are other people involved, you've got to process all this information as if it might be needed as evidence in other areas. So there are a variety of things that are going on right now. And of course, this is, uh, it appears, led by city police level officials. But uh, across the board, state law enforcement resources, federal law enforcement uh, resources, certainly processing crime scenes are being brought to bear on this situation in support of that local effort. Jason Johnson, as we watch these images coming out of Las Vegas and I see those students walking across their campus, I'm reminded just how young they are. I'm reminded also of the generational reality that most of them grew up doing active shooter drills in school. Um, and yet you're never quite prepared for this. They're, they're dealing and reckoning with the reality of a mess that the generations before have left for them. Alicia, I thought the same thing mm. as you when there was a mass shooting at Morgan six weeks ago. And that was my university campus. And I remember, and I've had this conversation with faculty, we're thinking, these are post-Columbine kids, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're used to this. They've been doing mass shooter drills. They're not OK. Yeah. They're not going to be OK. The impact of this kind of violence is so extreme yep. on the faculty, on the staff, on the feelings of everybody, and it lingers. And no matter what politicians say and how many drones you want to put around the school and how many new fences you want to create, unless we take a national attitude towards this sort of violence, these kids have lost their safety. There is a college freshman there who's left their home for the first time who's never going to feel safe on that campus again because of what just happened. Nelva Marquez-Green, who's become my, my moral North Star star uh, on these questions. She lost her daughter, Anna Grace, um, during Sandy Hook. Her son, Isaiah, survived. She often talks about the fact that, yes, we need to talk about gun safety reform. We also have to talk about the reality that this keeps happening yeah. and that there are communities after communities who are left in the wake without the support to deal with the reality of what has ensued. And we haven't even really begun to deal with what that means generationally for Americans who have grown up with this as a reality, who in, in some cases are surviving one mass shooting only to find themselves hopefully surviving another. I've commented on the fact that every university I've attended has had a mass shooting in the last year. University of Virginia, Chapel Hill, Morgan State, mm. every school. And you can't help but think if you are a generation, if you're 18, 19 years old now, you have to be thinking to yourself, all the, the run and hide, all the shelter in places, they still didn't keep me safe. We have a generation of young people now who will never feel safe anywhere, who will never have the opportunity. Remember, some of these kids also spent half of high school locked down during the pandemic. You know how hard it is for them to come outside and then they have this experience? That's. That's, I think, the emotional part of this that we don't discuss enough, how the long-term impact of this, they will need help, they will need therapy, they will need counseling on campus, and so will their parents to feel safe sending these kids back to school in the spring. One other thing I want to add, and this is, this is key as we're going to the, the press conference, and you talked about the tension between what can be shared and what mm -hmm. can't be shared. One of the key things that you have to do now when you're talking about a campus environment is you have to combat disinformation. Usually we think about that in politics, but remember this is a campus of thousands of students mm -hmm. who all have TikTok accounts, mm -hmm. who have Instagram accounts, who are going to be reporting from their perspective. Mom, dad, I was in my dorm. This is what I saw. This is what I saw. That's why in some of these instances, you initially think there might be more than one shooter because you hear students in different dorms reporting what their experiences are. So it's not just a matter of calming down the parents. It's not just a matter of law enforcement saying, hey, we're on the lookout for this, you have to calm down the various silos of information that people are collecting this from. Because if you don't do that, it increases the likelihood of one, future incidents, but two, students being afraid to come back to campus. They, they, they don't know. They're not watching the news. They're looking at TikTok. And when they saw someone say, I saw the shooter run through my dorm, 
that's how they're responding. So there's, there's a, a heavy responsibility with these press conferences to make sure that they're countering the disinformation and assuaging the concerns of people who need to try to figure out what they're going to do with the rest of their day. We, we track this element right. through every story, mm -hmm. and then we put it side by side with either legislation that exists, stop gaps that are in place, or ones that are proposed, and we say, could this have been different? And yet none of it can be different so long as there is not the cultural willingness yes. to reckon with the fact that guns are a part of the problem. You can tell me what the motivation is today, tomorrow, three weeks from now. It doesn't change what has happened on this campus, and it's not going to change the future possibility, and that's, that's the danger, right? That's, I'm thinking in terms of if it's terrorism, if it's just an angry incel, if it's about grades, it's the end of the semester. This could, it could be anything, right? It could be anything we don't know. Yeah, it could be anything we don't know. And that's the issue. Even once we find out, that doesn't change anyone's life, right? It, it's still going to have people being sad. We can come up with policy, but it, it's, it's playing whack-a-mole with larger cultural issues that you're talking about. It's not gonna solve things. And one thing I wanna point out, because like, we saw this in some of the video, you saw an armored truck, right? Now, that, that the military people there, it may be because they don't know what other weapons Weapons, things could be stored or cached around campus. One of the other things that we see with young people, with college students, is concerns about militarization of police and, and police observation and security issues. So even if you're trying to make the campus safer after this, even if we find out the motivation, you may have some on-campus resistance. You may have students say, I don't want my campus being turned into a prison. So you have that tension there with even once we find out are the solutions we're going to come up with turning this into a place that we don't want it to be. That's a reminder of this tragedy as opposed to moving forward. Layer upon layer upon layer. 